learn how to lead um like being a, a leader as opposed to a boss uh i think is is the the advice and that's been very helpful welcome to the cash flow chronicles i'm your host johnny katani and the founder of katani capital group for the last two years i've been studying alternative assets and now help solve the problem of creating passive cash flow for creators influencers and busy professionals by bringing you five episodes a week of easy to understand education in the world of passive investing. What's up guys? Welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Katani, and I'm joined today by AJ Shepard. AJ is the co-owner of Uptown Properties in Portland and a licensed Oregon contractor. He's been in the business since 2010 and prides itself as a leader in the local real estate market and property management community. Finding his passion in real estate and construction management has created an avenue for the company to help provide all services necessary to its clients, knowing the trade and the ability to manage Many allows for streamlined maintenance for the investor's property at a reduced cost. He's also the host of the West Side Investors podcast, Win. Win strives to provide knowledge and education to real estate professionals seeking to gain more freedom in their life. AJ and Chris are committed to sharing the wealth of knowledge they have gained throughout the years to allow others the opportunity to learn and grow in their investing. AJ, welcome to the show. Hey, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're grateful to have you. Uh, you've got quite the uh, resume, so I know there'll be a lot of uh, a lot of wisdom shared today, which I'm looking forward to. But kind of take us back. You know, what were you doing before real estate, or have you always been involved? And in what's kind of led you to where you're at now? Sure, sure. Uh, so probably one of the most influential people in my life about real estate is my dad. Um, you know. I want to say he had us uh, up on top of roofs uh, down in Arizona, like putting cool coat on when we were like 15 and 16, you know, and uh, I think even earlier on saw bathrooms being redone and some of his rentals. So, uh, you know, he's always been like, you know, you need to own real estate. You don't need to uh, uh, work for someone else for too long. So um, <clears throat> kind of right out of, after college, uh, actually during college, I, I got hooked up with a, uh, construction company that got then bought out by an engineering company that wanted a construction arm and kind of ended up working on like heavy industrial product uh projects uh i built one of the first chlorine plants in the u.s in like 30 years um it's down in longview washington and uh, we took an old plant from texas and an old plant from portland and shipped all the parts up and then put it back together on a new site and like redesigned it there um so it was kind of cool uh, and that kind of gave me the, I want to say like the structure and some of the stuff to do like smaller. So when it came to like houses, it was like, oh, this is easy construction. So this is like the same plan over and over again. It's the, the same stuff. And then, you know, going from like single family homes into apartments, then it was like, oh man, this is really easy to scale. I have to do, <laughs> design one apartment and then I get to do it 20, 30, 40 times. Uh, so um, that was kind of like a big eye opener in our, in our iteration of moving from single family homes to smaller multi to like bigger multi. And now that, that economy of scale uh, from like getting it set up to like getting fully through is makes it a lot easier from a management standpoint. So that's been pretty fun. Uh, I worked as like a con contractor, like doing project management for about five years after college. And I started buying houses with my brother kind of like one or two years after college, like having that good W-2 income uh, qualifies you for a lot of loans. So we were buying houses and then refinancing them and kind of doing burr before burr even was coined that with bigger pockets like this was uh back in 2007 2008 uh we were super lucky in our timing because we started buying on the way down of the market and our philosophy is like buying properties kind of like buying stocks as long as you buy all the time your prices average out uh it's like averaging down or averaging up um if you're not familiar with those terms, um, don't really go look them up. Just look more into real estate. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so we, we got lucky and we just, you know, tried to keep buying more and more units. Um, and then uh, it was, I think it was like 2010, 2011 timeframe. Um, the, uh, 
the industrial market started to feel like more of the downturn. Um, and so we had got amassed enough properties. We were like, Hey, let's open a property management company to get some more income. Um, I think I'd gotten uh, almost, I, th I think I'd gotten 10 loans to my name by that time. Uh, and my brother wasn't working. He was doing, uh, he was playing poker for a living. Uh, so he had cash, but no income uh, to put down on for a loan. So I was the one that qualified for the loans. And then um, we we're like, hey, we need we need income from businesses to uh, qualify for loans. And that's when we're like, oh, let's open up property management and construction. So that's when I got my contractor's license and I got my property manager's license uh, to manage both of those companies. And then um, my brother went the track of getting a broker's license so then he hung his broker's license hat under someone else um i don't know where most people are from but in most states there's kind of like the triangle of principal broker and then property manager and broker and so property managers can operate without a principal broker uh, as long as you just do that but um since there was two of us in a partnership we decided we wanted to kind of do both so that we could ultimately in the end open up our our, our own brokerage um which we did in like 2018 wow um, yeah uh so we kept buying properties and then also taking on third-party management growing the company taking on employees um around 2014 2015 we uh we started hiring uh employees from the philippines um this was great uh you know we found property management had a lot of repetitive tasks uh we got burned in uh construction doing third party from some people not paying and stuff so we we're kind of dumped that business from a like a service standpoint and determined that we are just going to only service our own companies so we don't do like a, you know we're not going into someone's home where they look at the work and or look see the guys do the work and like and want a kitchen remodel that has to be like the finest of detail and everything like we found that there's just like large disconnect between uh you know that individual home person that works for someone else and like the cost of like what things cost um so we just kind of were just like, no, we're only working on investment properties, only working for mostly our own or like, you know, the the property management clients. Uh, and we uh, we started syndication in I think 20, 2019 is when we kind of like set out our goal. We're like, we want to do this syndication thing. So we set out to learn all about it. So I listened to a ton of podcasts, ran a bunch of read a bunch of books we like took some uh webinars on it and just like really we started signing up for other people's deals i think we invested in someone else's deal as well and then um we uh the best thing that we did was we actually we bought an eight unit in our uh market and we're like man um it would be nice to have all that capital like why don't we mock it up? So we we took that and we like mocked it up as like a syndication, like if we were going to sell it. So we use those marketing materials. We took that and we said, "Hey, we this should be easy to do. We we got all the we got like the uh, attorney docs and like all the legal docs all done, all the all the marketing materials, all that sort of stuff, just like prepped, ready. I think we even had the investment software." uh when just like making sure that we were we were on next step is like you know getting something else in contract and like all we had to do was raise the money as opposed to getting something in contract and then having to do a ton of this like other stuff and like just having you know it's like a shiny squirrel over here and you have to do this and you have to do that and so it took us like a year to get all that stuff ready uh which was that was a long time. Um, I think a lot of other people are like getting into coaching and that coaching program kind of cuts that down by totally. a third or a quarter or something. So from our standpoint, we, we had services businesses and, and learning it on our own. We've always been that type of person. That's like, 
oh no we're gonna do it ourselves <laughs> i think i mean there's like I totally. can tell you, like, I've got pictures of my brother and I when we first started out, like we're ripping out hardwood floors, like we're there with Burke bars and we're doing painting or I, I don't know. But if it comes down to it, like I can do it myself now. I've just figured out I just don't like to do it myself. Totally. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it's been it's been good. We've done five or six syndications since then. And then that's uh, kind of what brings us to where we're at right now um so it's been a it's been an exciting journey uh and uh, excited to see where we go too so um, wow yeah <laughs> yeah that is quite the journey that's a lot but um that's a stacked resume you know and uh obviously well i shouldn't say obviously but it, it makes sense why you know you transition over to the multifamily syndication side because now you have this incredible track record i'm sure you've got a network of people you know, to kind of go out and raise capital. And you're even doing that right, where you're starting with kind of smaller deals, getting that proof of concept as well. Um, so really a great kind of little masterclass there for new investors as to like, you know, a really solid plan, you know, 10 year plan of like, hey, you know, start small, there's something to be said about that, you know, it can work, get that proof of concept, grow it. And then you go out and start using other people's money and doing the syndications. I love that you mentioned dollar cost averaging. As a former <laughs> stockbroker, I tell people you can do that in real estate and you should do that in real estate because well, it, it takes the fear fear out of buying. It's like yes. as long as you keep buying and you just have that like goal of like, I'm going to buy one property every year or I'm going to buy one fourplex every year or like whatever that, or every two years, like it doesn't matter where the market is. Um, you just, it's, it's not like a home that you live in where you're trading your wages for your like rent, essentially. Like every time you buy a house, then when you trade up or down, it depends on the equity, but with investment property, like the prices go up and down pretty similar to like what a market does. And as long as you keep buying, like you're going to be fine. Totally. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, you know, people get worried about interest rates, like, well, you can always refinance when the interest rate goes down, you know, and as long as the numbers make sense, you know, that's the biggest key, right, is like, you know, especially now a lot of creative or seller financing is starting to, you know, become prevalent again. And, you know, some people can fall into a trap of, you know, seller financing It's like, oh, it's got to be a good deal at seller finance. It's like, well, no, you can still be underwater in a seller finance deal. So, you know, while it's important to keep buying, it's also important to understand your market and know what you're getting into, making sure it makes sense. You know, of course, in the beginning, we've all done that bad deal where it's like, okay, that was wrong. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, well, you know, interest rates right now when we're recording this are, uh, I think, like uh, six and a half to seven or some somewhere in that range. Fed has come out and said they're going to raise it another quarter point and then pause or whatnot. But you brought up like, oh, but isn't right now a good time to buy? Um, you know, from from my standpoint, like we're looking at the market and we're being like, okay, inflation is, you know, they raise interest rates to like have inflation like kind of stop and start coming down, but inflation's not going anywhere. I mean, with the cost of goods going up, cost of labor going up, that means the replacement cost to replace anything is going to go up. Development cost is going up. Like, there's no way that housing pricing is going down like right i don't know these people that say oh we're in a bubble it's going to go down like i i mean unless there's like a significant population decrease like and a like economics like demand like fall like i just i have a hard time and yeah like some people move in and stack families up like you know you get your uh, older parents that move into a place and that might reduce like kind of like the demand a little bit, but like, we're not going to see a huge, huge drop. So um, we kind of think like right now is if you can stomach the interest rates for a short amount of time. So put a deal together. That's like, you know, a two to five year deal and you can afford those interest rates. Like seems like there's going to be some great opportunities. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of why we're we're we've always been bullish on buying um you know the cost segregations and the tax depreciation that come along with buying uh almost it makes it very much worth it so uh 
yeah, we're we're actually like fairly optimistic and like looking into like second and or third and fourth quarter of this year. Totally. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I, I share the same sentiment when it comes to it, you know, um, because the, what's happening now is you're starting to see distressed sellers. And if you're in, you know, in the market and you've got your kind of ear to the ground, those opportunities are going to show themselves to you. And, you know, if you put the pencils down and, you know, lift your ear up, you're going to miss stuff. And it's not to say that, you know, I'm of the belief that when everything starts to look good, you're probably late if that's when you're just starting to jump in. So not to say you can't still get stuff done and appreciation and whatnot, but uh, I definitely share that that same uh, kind of sentiment with you uh, as well. So now as you guys move forward, are you going to focus more on syndications? Yeah. Um, we always do have like those, we, we just have those processes set up in our market in Portland. So we, um, you know, we're brokers, we've got brokers working for us. So deals come across our desk, no matter what type of deal they are. So we're, we're typically not buying anything less than four units right now. Um, but we, we do have a couple four units under, under contract. And, uh, but as far as where like the main main amount of our time, like my brother and I are are very much focusing on syndication and putting deals together. Um, we are starting to look in like the Jacksonville market in Florida. Um, we've had a, another guy that owns a property management company that's been in like one of our masterminds for a while and just like, no, trust him. And he's like, yeah, let's, let's put something together. So starting to look at, uh, at deals down there and trying to figure out how to get into that market. Um, went down there and played some golf and, uh, we've, we've been down there a couple of times now, just like shaking hands with brokers, uh, taking them out to lunch, uh, taking them out to drinks. Uh, we went to the players championship and, and oh, nice. met, up, met up with a, a couple of them there. So, you know, it's, it's those relationships that, uh, you know, we've it, it, definitely in our market in, in Oregon, like those, there's like five or 10 guys that do 90% of the multifamily deals that are actually deals. Um, and then we're finding that it's, it's the same way kind of like everywhere. Uh, so coming in as a strong buyer as someone that's got a track record and, and being able to show that is, is super helpful. Or so we have a lot of newer investors who listen for newer investors, you know, what are some ways that you can still get a foot in the door with some of these brokers? Like you mentioned, obviously taking them to lunch, doing things, of course, you know, schmoozing them, but like, what's the conversation like to position yourself so that you can, you know, show that, Hey, you know, I am a willing buyer, although I don't have, you know, this big, long track record, you know, what are some, some ways that you can still position yourself? Do you have any insight there? Um, I guess, I mean, for someone like that, uh, I think you're kind of describing maybe like a capital raiser that's coming in and wants to partner with maybe an operator or a, and a key partner. Um, so to me, finding out like, getting that key partner relationship identified who is that and that's part of their job is like to be that track record experience and and kind of like has some money in the bank so i would be you know involving that key partner and developing those uh broker relationships and it's like hey this is this is what you're you know what you're contributing to the partnership so i i need you like you know at least they like you respond to an email and be like, yeah, here's this is what my PFS looks like, or this is what it looked like five years ago. Like, I, I don't know how, what, how can that, how can you have that key partner help out a little bit? Um, I, I think is uh, probably a good opportunity. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. It's important, especially in the beginning to focus on good partnerships, but you know, like you said, being able to add value, you know, to me, the two best ways you mentioned one, obviously capital raising, I think that's the best way to get into the industry if you can bring capital, but also finding deals, right, which is kind of a double edged sword, because you need a broker relationship. So like you said, you know, being able to bring a team to the table with the broker where it's like, hey, I'm new, but you know, this guy's got the, you know, 
net worth to back it up. And, oh, this guy's done deals before, um, you know, where you kind of have your, your team together uh, already. You know, I think then you can, you know, enter the brokers will at least entertain you. Uh, yeah. I mean, like getting that whole team together of like, you know, this is what we're going to do and setting out that goal and just being confident with, you know, you've, you've got all the players in place and you've got it. I, you know, the last thing that you need is like the identified property. Um, you know, you've, you've got a bunch of investors ready to go. They're waiting on the sideline. They're, they're hungry. And like, you know, giving that kind of uh, rapport off to, to the brokers uh, definitely helps. Um, and having a partner that has some sort of track record and bringing them into the conversation, uh, you know, even if they can't get to the market, then, uh, you know, through maybe some zoom calls or something like that. And I love it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So uh, uh, one thing I like that you mentioned, you're looking at other markets, is that due to like kind of the macroeconomics kind of a force thing, or is that kind of always been the, the plan to eventually, you know, look at other markets and are you exploring other assets as well or just markets? I'm sure you haven't heard of Portland, Oregon on, on the national news lately, right? <laughs> no, never. <laughs> you know, uh, Portland has like typically been the breeding ground for like all these landlord laws. Uh, we recently in the past like three, four years had uh, statewide rent control placed in and um, like the city of Portland has like when this when the rent control came in it was like seven percent plus cpi and we're like oh well that's 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 doable it's not great but like we're not gonna make a ton of money but like it's gonna be kind of like in you know it's gonna be okay well you know cpi with inflation went up and this is where we really got scared right and it's like oh well, they got used to the number being a number cap, AKA 10%. And then, oh, now it jumped up to 15% because that's what the market's doing. And they're like, oh no, renters can't bear 15% rent markup. So we're going to ratchet that down to 10. Well, CPI is only going to be that long for so long. So uh, that base, I think they reduced or are reducing um, or they just did a cap. I don't know what's going on, but um we've had some laws passed like very, very recently and we're still uh, getting that kind of like into our processes. Uh, that's not my job anymore. So I'm not super. And then also Portland passes different stuff. Um, we are, we're in the tri-county area. So we have three different counties and there's, there's just a lot of stuff going on here that makes it more difficult to manage. Um and we, I always hear about all these other deals in red states and how it's easier. And, you know, honestly, like, we're like, this, that sounds nice. And it, yeah, <laughs> we might be, we might be, oh, the grass is greener on the other side, right? Like maybe our mousetrap is here and we figured out how to, you know, utilize uh, labor from the Philippines, have really good processes, be really streamlined, like really efficient. And we go to another market and like, the expenses are higher. I mean, like one of the things we found in Jacksonville is like property taxes are outrageous. Uh, you know, the rent revenue is not quite like what we see here for premiums. And so the the expense ratio on when we're underwriting is just astronomical. Like, wow. my gosh, how do how do people underwrite deals? You know, and we're we're going through that and we're figuring it out. Uh, insurance cost in Florida, uh, yeah, I mean, way high with the hurricanes. Everybody's like, you know, jumping up. So finding out that like niche and you know who's who's that insurance guy that can you know really make a deal work. Uh, so we're working our way through those problems, but um, yeah, we're we're just interested in in seeing you know if it's, if, if the grass really is greener on the other side. My my thought is that it's it's probably not. It's probably just about the same because markets are markets um but uh yeah um i think it's going to be good it's going to be good for us uh and we're excited about it totally yeah i mean you know a lot of it obviously i mean the last hurricane ripping through like the entire state you know now you've got insurance going up for the whole state because now they're aware that like hurricanes can you know obviously hit anywhere um 
but yeah, I mean, you know, certainly market dependent will, you know, I think there are going to be pockets that get hit harder. You know, a lot of markets shot through the roof, obviously, you know, those, what goes up must come down. So some of those are going to come back down. And, you know, I love that you made that point where the grass isn't greener, you know, it really is, you know, understanding the market more than just like, oh, wow, we can hit a home run in this market because, you know, everything's working here as opposed to these other markets. I, I think that, you know, you kind of have this blanket sort of challenge, you know, just in the industry as a, as a whole. Yeah. I, I mean, I definitely think that there are markets that are going up and there's markets that are going down, but I still like the economics of it says that like whatever someone's willing to pay for it and get money out of it. And yeah, there's like these little intricacies here and there, but I found that like in business, the people that know more are generally the ones that do better. Uh, and and like really knowing that market, diving down, understanding how all the costs work, understanding what all the costs are, uh, is really going to be, you know, that, that operator uh, that just knows that information and maybe has proprietary information in that area is, is really going to, I would think, do quite well. Um, and so that's like, you know, your property manager partner, like the guy that's got you know, comps across the street from the place you want to buy. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Who leased them up just the other day. <laughs> yes. Very invaluable information right there for sure. Um, are you guys looking to potentially, you know, maybe co-GP with some established operators there to kind of get your foot in the door? Or are you looking to just take down your own deals? Um, right. Yeah. I think right now we're looking for somewhere between like 30 and 80 units. Uh, it's kind of what we, we know that we can take down. Um, like I said, we've got that property manager partner down there and he's, uh, he's, he's done some development stuff. He hasn't done like the actual syndication. So I think we'll probably code GP, uh, with him to, uh, help raise some money. He's, he's super involved in the community down there. So yeah, we're just we're excited to have something something get put together. Um, we keep looking at deals, and I'm hoping to one's actually <laughs> going to pencil here soon. So we'll see. What seems to be kind of killing them? Is it a combo? Is it just the debt side? Is it you know debt intra, um, insurance? All the things. What what are you kind of seeing? Yeah, I mean, like when we compare the underwriting to like what we're looking at in Portland, like there's probably three or four things that are killing it. It's it's the the rent premium, so less than overall rent. So up here, two bedroom, we're getting fifteen, sixteen hundred down there. Two bedrooms, like eleven to thirteen hundred. Wow. So then on top of that, then the expenses go up. So revenue goes down, and then the expenses go up, and the expenses are like. Uh, we're looking at an expense ratio of like 55% compared to like up here, we're somewhere like 40, 35 to 45. Uh, wow. And I don't know if that's just like our, what we do to operate. I mean, we have, like I said, labor in the Philippines. We do self-showing on our boxes. Like if there's an office manager, we usually take them out and, and do it from our office because it's close close enough from our office so we like we take advantage of some other efficiencies of being local to the market um and then like that insurance and taxes piece which add to those expenses and those are really sometimes things that you can't control too too much taxes uh I, i've heard and i, I haven't quite uh, got understanding but um let's see this was just told to me i haven't done this so uh, first of all, I'm not a CPA or a attorney, so I can't give legal or tax advice. But what I've heard is that in, in Florida, there's the ability to split out the leases from the actual property. So the, the taxes are calculated on the asset value or improvement value. Um, usually it's the improvement value. And I think they even segregate out the land. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but like, so what they do is through the buying process, they separate out all this intellectual property, which they like consider the leases, the contracts, uh, the software, like whatever it is from the property. And, and they remove that from the sales price and have like a separate business sale for that. So then 
they can like keep the the land low to then like keep the taxes low um and on larger purchases that would seem like you could save a significant amount of money on taxes um to 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 the point it would be worth you know employing a lawyer to to make that happen as part of the sale but i still i don't know what the ramifications are for the seller in that aspect like if they're you know selling for less money and then it's a business purchase like how that affects taxes i don't know i there's there's something going on there that like i need to do more research on we're we're looking into we're trying to find the guy that does it and and how it works but it was an interesting concept um so yeah those those expenses like insurance taxes and then the the lack of revenue just is where we're seeing deals differ from our market significantly that like makes them not pencil interesting that's definitely fascinating i'm a little surprised well i guess not really but a little bit shocked that jacksonville is not at least you know right level in terms of rent premiums with portland because jacksonville is growing like crazy a lot of people jumping into that market a lot of people moving there a lot of new infrastructure so that is interesting to see that it's so yeah. for florida you know a state that you know relatively has a relatively high cost of living um uh, portland oregon has an urban growth boundary so the development is uh sick and the the city charges a lot for development uh so it's it's pretty it's pretty elevated uh and the uh, land so the land under supplied yeah and the land that like is available for development is is very very low so that has like increased prices uh quite a bit um and then jacksonville is like i found this out when i was i was down there it's like the biggest city in the u.s by by land square square footage I was like, no way. And I looked it up and it, it is. Um, wow. It's like just like one of the biggest counties and one of the biggest cities. Uh, so they, they actually have a lot of land to develop within the city. And yeah, there has been a ton of development there, which is great. Um, but that oversupply then kind of washes out rent uh, increases. They have recently in the past, like I looked at some statistic three years, I think had like 50% increase in rent in the last like three years. Wow. Um, and I think it, it seemed like it was just getting caught up to where a lot of like the coastal markets um, are. So I think in the last quarter, uh, they actually saw a decrease in rent, like a three to two to three percent decrease in the last quarter. That's the most recent data. But uh, much like everywhere else, I'm sure they're on like a cycle, uh, like as you see, like rent premiums and you're looking to buy and looking to sell, um, you know, the summer months for like our market are huge. Like we, we mostly write all of our leases to end in like May, end of, end of April, May, June. Um, just so like people can move with kids, move in the weathers when the weather's nice. So like, there's just a lot of churn, um, much more supply and much more demand during those times. So like, it's not uncommon to see a, small decrease in the first first quarter uh, of a year, especially when your statistics are coming out a little bit later too. Totally. Yeah, Salt Lake is experiencing um, kind of the same, same thing. A lot of new supply coming on. Absorption not quite there yet, but it's getting there. So same kind of thing, kind of flat and or that kind of two to 3% uh, decrease, you know, for much the same reason. But, you know, a year from now, it'll all be absorbed and, you know, kind of be, be back. This is just kind of one of those years, you know, um, like you said, it's a cycle, right? The the whole economy goes in one. So that's kind of where we're at and certainly something to keep an eye on uh, that makes it interesting, you know, as an investor, especially on the active side, where you're trying to even move to new markets and and get an idea. So um, awesome, AJ. Well, I appreciate all your insight. This has been incredible. Um, we'll yeah. jump to the final five. Uh, first question, best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Learn how to lead. Um, like being a, a leader as opposed to a boss, uh, I think is, is the, the advice. And that's been very helpful. Um, so yeah. Love that. 
Uh, what is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? We've really stuck to adding value, uh, either through construction, property management, but like taking these communities and providing, uh, developing a, a better place and just like elevating the community around us really, really feels good. Uh, and that like concept of adding value um some of our you know employees that are over in the philippines like we've literally changed their lives which is crazy that's like awesome. they're able to buy a house now um you know they the work is tough they work you know uh overnight uh during like our business hours but, right like the wage for them is like double what a like standard construction wage would be over there so like they're just killing it with the work doing a great job and then like we're able to like significantly add value to their lives through that. Totally. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, favorite non-real estate or investment related book? Non-real estate? Yep. <laughs> uh, does self-help still count? <laughs> self-help counts. Absolutely. Yeah. It does? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Joey Coleman's Never Live as a Customer Again is absolutely amazing. So he takes you through the like, 10 steps of like the customer's hundred day journey. So it's not, it can be applicable to real estate. So I kind of cheated there, but it's mostly applicable to just business in general. So like, as you get this client on and he like, he labels all these stages and helps you understand like how they feel. And then, so taking that and whatever your like onboarding process is for a client or understanding like, Oh, did they, did they have buyer's remorse? Like, how do you like, make it so they don't have buyer's remorse when they spend like something large on on this so totally wow love that added that to the list great recommendation uh if you have any superpower what would it be mm, probably omniscient nice love if, that. i mean if if you just know everything and know the future like you can manipulate i'm pretty sure anything <laughs> totally yeah absolutely uh awesome what's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more yeah so our, our i think you mentioned our podcast west side investors network uh win for short um is is a great way uh my information's up there you can fill out a form that gets to me uh and then yeah my my email is plastered all over the place i'm on linkedin uh social media so um you can just google my name aj shepherd <laughs> it's usually a good way uh, I was always told to like own, own your own name. So like I do have the website, ajshepherd.com. <laughs> Same. Yeah, I have, I have my name as well too. I love that. It's not, there's no landing page, right? I just own the domain for now until. Oh um, yeah. I had a whole website created. It was great. Nice. That's yeah, awesome. Fiverr, Fiverr's awesome. Just, you know, hop on there and be like, Hey, someone needs to create a webpage for me. So totally love it. Awesome. Well, we'll link down the show notes, make it super easy. AJ, thank you again. This has been absolutely amazing. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you again for tuning in. Who do you know that wants more cash flow? Share this episode with them so you can grow your cash flow together. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you're subscribed on your platform of choice so you never miss a new episode. Go to KataniCapitalGroup.com to learn more.